Welcome everybody, my name is James Walters, I'm chaplain at the London School of Economics and I oversee the work of this faith centre that we're celebrating today as part of the opening of this wonderful new building. The faith centre has three purposes, the first is it's a facility for the very diverse religious observance that we have on this campus and I'm delighted that that diversity has been reflected today in the uh, faith leaders and guests who we've welcomed for lunch and it's been great to have you with us, we look forward to developing further links with you. Second, it's uh, a well-being resource for the whole school, for staff and students, and we had a big yoga session in here this morning. And third, uh, it is a home to our expanding interfaith program and uh, our engagement from a faith perspective uh, in the student body with uh, issues of concern in the world today. Hence, this dialogue uh, about the environment and uh, its relationship to religious narratives. Uh, and I'm very grateful in its organizing and, and, and uh, for uh, his support to the director who's going to chair, Craig Calhoun, and I hand over to him now. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's my pleasure to be moderating this dialogue, but I want to begin by saying I am not even a little bit moderate in regard to my appreciation for the LSE Faith Center. I think that it's a tremendous achievement that we have this wonderful space and that this wonderful space has been embraced as it has been by students from a variety of different faiths. We have regular services here, we have individual meditation, we have dialogue, as Jim mentioned, in the interfaith community. Um, this is an extraordinary resource for the school and I think a way in which the school increases the contributions it makes in wider ways. So it's a pleasure to be at this opening event. And I'm very grateful to Jim and to all who work to make this possible because it includes uh, people like Jim's predecessor, David, who's here from somewhere. I don't see him, but there he is. Um, and Janet Hartley, who is the pro-director for teaching and learning when this faith center was conceived and the work undertaken to build it. I'm also very pleased that we are in front of this beautiful stained glass window with its theme of desert and its evocation of the desert origins of many of the faiths that are um, important to the students and others who worship here. And it is also appropriate to our discussion today. It has a sense of the sacred and of the sacred earth of, that is not specific to any particular faith but that evokes something in common about our habitation of the world. And our theme today is to explore the role of religion in the context of an escalating environmental crisis. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Williams of Oystermouth, Bowen. It's very nice to have you here. And Bruno Latour, who is an LSE Centennial professor in the Department of Sociology, and also a professor at Sciences Po in Paris, and known to many of you for his extensive work. In fact, each of our participants has written so much that you will be amazed that they have time to come here and actually <laughs> speak and talk with us, but they do. And I'm not going to say a lot more by way of, of um, introduction and invitation, but encourage you to know their works further. Um, Rowan Williams, has a long-standing interest in the environment that now feeds into his role as chair of Christian Aid, but that is also figured in some of his published work. He is now Master of Mullen College at Cambridge. Bruno Latour, whom I introduced, has been very active in uh, engagement around ecological conflicts. He gave an extremely well-attended public lecture at LSC that provoked a lot of engagement and thought on war and peace in the time of ecological conflicts last year and has written extensively on this. A common denominator between our two speakers is that they each recently delivered the Gifford Lectures on Natural Theology at the University of Edinburgh. We are not going to ask them to repeat those performances here before us today, um, and we're not going to ask them only to find common denominators, but to join in a discussion that may even in include disagreements. If any of you find the points made of interest enough to want to tweet about them, the hashtag for today's event is <laughs> hash L-S-E-S-S-H. Um, however, I would ask you to put your phones on silent uh, so as not to disrupt the event. 
today's event is being recorded, and we hope it will be available as a podcast in the near future. And as usual, after the dialogue, there will be a chance for you to put questions to our guests. I'm going to invite them each to make a very brief opening statement to engage with each other for a few minutes. I may, if, if they aren't being provocative enough, I'll try to ask a provocative question, and then we will open it up to the floor. Rowan, would you go first? Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here on an occasion like this, and I'm most grateful for the invitation and grateful that LSE has taken this <coughs> wonderful initiative with the center. I want to begin by making a proposal about the way we use words to do with the sacred, and to say that the language of the sacred tells us, tells me, that the category of ownership whether with things or with persons, is unusable. We do not have absolute ownership of our environment, our bodies, other people's bodies, etc. It's simply the wrong category. Because in the perspective of the sacred, every thing, every form of energy and life every person, a fortiori, is related before they're related to me with a deeper, more universal <coughs> energy agency with the sacred, with God, in my own framework. So I want to say that the use of the language of the sacred is or ought to be a language which liberates. That is a language which liberates one person from the control of another, which liberates my own sense of myself from being, let's say, a mind owning or controlling a body, which liberates the environment around me from being something that is there for my disposal, there for my agenda. And I relate that with, within one particular strand of the Christian world to the way in which some of the Greek Christian writers of the 4th, 5th century speak about what it is to know things truly. Truly knowing, truly relating to any element in the universe is relating with the detached, in the proper sense, contemplative, compassionate perspective of the maker. It's the opposite of that ownership obsession which so scars and distorts our relationships in all manner of directions. So I want to say, <laughs> somebody saw me through the floor. <laughs> I want to say that as a general framing of the remarks I make and the, I hope the discussion we're going to have, but I'd add just one more thing to that, which I think is already implicit in what I've said. It's clear that if we move away from a worldview in which ownership dominates everything, at least two things follow. One is we are bound to have some quite serious, quite far-reaching questions to ask about the way we use the language of growth in our economic life. And I would guess that that is somewhere near the neuralgic center of um, much of our discussion around the environment. Second is there are implications about what we mean by knowing itself. One thing that's been very much in my mind, especially in thinking through these issues in recent years, is the strong sense that we still inherit a model of knowledge, human knowledge, as dividing neatly into real knowledge, which is hard and objective, in inverted commas, and solves problems, and the rather vague, impressionistic, and probably not very interesting kinds of knowledge that people like ordinary human beings, um, poets, religious believers, advanced theoretical scientists, and all those unimportant characters work with. That second kind of knowledge, which is far more exploratory, far more physically located, far more embodied as a form of knowledge, that we have learned to 
to place lower down on a scale than the kind of knowledge which neatly slices up a territory, identifies the problems to be solved, and moves on. So if we do open out our thinking from that basic point of view, which I said is essential to thinking about the sacred in terms of con contesting the language of ownership, then some of the implications have to do with those very immediate issues for all of us. What do we think of growth as the purpose of our economic activity? What do we think knowledge means with the implication there? What is our real locatedness as thinkers in the material world? We seem not only to think so often of our relation to the environment as that of owner and possessor. We also seem to think of a basic division in the universe between mental activity and passive stuff. <coughs> the poet, the religious believer, and the advanced theoretical scientist will all agree that passive stuff is not what the universe is made of. And one of the most bizarre and exhilarating aspects of our contemporary intellectual world is the growing recognition of how far, how, I should say how very little distance, not how far, but how very little distance the language of passive stuff can take us. Rather than living in a universe of passive stuff, we live, and this is where um, Professor Latour's recent Gifford lectures make a huge contribution, we live in a world where fundamental agency is at work in all that we are as a source, plaiting itself together, feeding back on itself, producing new levels of complexity, including the complexity that is mind and spirit. So that's a rather large program for rethinking our, our metaphysics, but it seems to me to be a program which both theology and science ought to find, make that perfect sense, which instead of allowing us to think so there are no more questions to ask, allows us to think the most interesting questions are still to be asked. Perhaps I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you, Rowan. Bruno. Well, I think I will simply footnote uh, what Lord Williams um, said. But I want to preface it by the quote from the gospel of today, at least in the Catholic tradition, because I was a bit reassured about this dialogue, because it says, and this is Luke 12, 6, 56, you hypocrites, you can discern the appearance of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Which I found is a good auspice for this discussion, because of course, we have difficulty understanding the weather as well. I mean, some people have difficulty understanding climate science, and we have a lot of difficulty to discern the time. In French, of course, temps et temps, weather and time is the same word, so it doesn't work so much so well here. Uh, and I think that's uh, a general, um, as, as Lord William just said, which is, uh, maybe it's an invention of new metaphysics, but it's also knowing how to discern the sign of a time, which have something to do with agency. So I will footnote some of the things that uh, Lord William just said. One of them is about uh, the history of religion has always been linked to a cosmology, not only in cosmology, but also to an organization of a space. Um, I mean, a church has always been a way, whatever the church or whatever the definition of a church, a way to organize space, to develop uh, ideas about rituals, to organize the ways the mores are distributed and so on. So there is a large, uh, in a way, you could say churches have always <laughs> been uh, uh, equal, uh, motivated in some ways because they, they transform the landscape, so to speak. I mean, there's always a transformative aspect of it. So uh, that, that's one of the tradition which we could re recover uh, if we wanted to get into this uh, large program that you just uh, articulated. The second thing has to do with science because this is my, my original uh, field, which is the history of, of, of science. And there's a difficulty here because, of course, a tradition uh, has been an excess of distance with, with the things studied. Uh, so 
it, it's interesting. <coughs> you mentioned that ownership was a bad way of understanding possession. But of course, um, the tr traditional view of science, which is not the one you advocate, of course, was that there was too much distance, on the contrary, with the thing known and the knower. Uh, and my version of science is, on the contrary, that science is a, one of the most localized, entrenched, uh, instituted uh, activity. And the realization among the scientists of that thing, which has been known for a long time in history of science, especially in Britain, came from a, a dispute around climate science, where suddenly the scientists discovered that uh, the defense of science as view from nowhere could not at all protect uh, the science of climate against not only skepticism, which would have been normal, but against negationism, which is, of course, uh, not only a crime against knowledge, but also a sin. And uh, this, this is a, an, an important change that our conception of science, especially coming from religion, has to change, as you just said, because science is the most incarnated the most localized, the most networky, most fleshy uh, aspect. And every rethinking of incarnation requires to have a view of science which is itself incarnate. Science Incarnate is actually the title of a book by my colleague uh, Shevin. The third aspect, which I footnote here, and I'm slightly worried to say that in front of Greg, because the problem is that the ownership theory, which is called economics, is actually made here at the LSC <laughs> and make the fortune of the LSC by inventing, making people coming from all over the world to know what it is to be owning a thing. And that's called economic theory, with a great indifference to the, out, to the externality, externality, to use an economic term. So it's very nice to have, I mean, sorry, I've never talked to an audience like this, and I've never talked to an interfaith, not to a faith audience. So maybe I'm saying things which are not very polite. But this place might produce the counter poison of a poison which is taught in the other part of the LSC buildings, I'm afraid, which is uh, this idea that people come here with a very old notion of common and sharing, etc., and they get out with a master, a very expensive one, where they lead and leave this place with a knowledge that actually you can ignore the externality and become really an owner in the sense that. Lord William just criticized. So I'm slightly worried, or, or I mean, you had, uh, you have just hired Greiber, so <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, you cannot do an interfaith place like this without producing the counter poison everywhere in the church. Be sorry, this is maybe too polemical, but it, I'm, I'm just footnoting what you just said. Uh, the big problem of, of, of the climate, of economy, as you Lord William said in one of his, of his uh, speech, actually, uh, is that between economics and ecology, there is a war. I mean, it's impossible to do two, the, two, the two at once. And uh, this is, of course, a uh, very important prime with uh, Moltmann, in one of his books, mentioned that ecology could be called the house of the father, the house of the logos, which is a nice definition of what the metaphysics that you mentioned uh, before. And just a final uh, point, one of the big primes around uh, this new metaphysics that you are uh, advocating is a rethinking of what uh, paganism is about. Because of course, I mean, I'm he seeing here with a lot of, of qualms, uh, because it's the interfaith context, a lot of a difficulty, at least in, uh, maybe this is more true in France and Germany and Italy uh, than here, uh, that people from the, the, the so-called monotheistic, monotheistic church have with ecology is that we think that ecology is about paganism, which is, of course, a complete uh, category mistake because what we are talking here, and you mentioned the name agency, is mundane, not pagan. So um, mundane, the word in English, a mundane yeah, yeah, view yeah. of it. So it's neither secular, nor natural, nor worldly, or worldly, but it's earthly and mundane. And earthly and mundane is, is, is a tradition which has to be remade entirely, what it is to be mundane. Science is mundane, it's not secular. And um, in a sort of interesting way, what we are looking for is a renewal of the notion of incarnation, at least in the Christian tradition, which goes toward mundane. Uh, so I'm slightly worried by the word sacred, which of course immediately 
uh, has the counterpoise of profane mm. uh, and, and triggers a lot of difficulty, whereas mundane uh, is, is, I think, one way of, of getting into a lot of other uh, view and avoid the, the accusation of paganism, which has completely the wrong association. And of course, the figure I'd like to introduce, since we were sharing the same Gifford uh, lectures uh, last year, a year ago, um, is the name of Gaia. Uh, I mentioned that there is an exhibition on Lovelock in the Science Museum, which is quite amazing. Uh, and Lovelock, of course, that Lord William cites often, uh, I mean, sometimes at least, uh, is a very interesting figure because Gaia is one of his completely ambiguous terms, which is simultaneously, um, people say, um, sort of New Age uh, religion, but after all, being New Age in an interfaith audience is not necessarily bad. And uh, also a scientific term of a sort of fringe science, but no longer so fringe. Uh, and it's also, of course, a very important polity, a definition of a sovereign. So around the notion of Gaia turns a lot of the discussion about what uh, Schmidt would call a new uh, political theology, because of course the political theology is, is the important part uh, in renewing this metaphysic that you, you mentioned before. So I think that uh, one of the few footnotes which I wanted to, to add, uh, the figure of Gaia is, is a really interesting figure. Okay, you failed to be provocative enough. <laughs> so I'm going to say one more thing. No, the, these are great opening remarks. And I actually want to see whether Rowan wants to embrace this idea of the mundane, the mondin, I mean, the slightly different nuance of the anglicized word, the, uh, um, the mundane as the worldly in that sense, the, and the, the setting aside of the idea of sacred, or whether we need an idea like the notion of sacred of something higher or beyond, in some sense, to organize perspective on this, the way he was saying. But I have to first interject that I want to embrace Bruno's point. Interfaith dialogue at the LSE must situate economics as one of the faiths <laughs> in the dialogue. <laughs> I, I would certainly echo that, or if. Um, Ecology or exactly in to talk about one of the myths in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, With a more a sense of mythos sense that of mythos, is not yes. entirely yes. reduction to falsity. Absolutely. Um, one distinguished um, LSE figure, David Martin, of course, has published mm -hmm. a book very recently on religion and power, No Logos Without Mythos, and lays out there, if we needed to be reminded, that we live by mythical systems, that is, we live by large narratives. Indeed. And the economics that has prevailed for so much of the last century is mythical in that respect. It's a highly sophisticated narrative with dramas, heroes, villains, gods, providences, and all the rest of it. And one of the most deadly things that we can be lured by, as David Martin has often repeated, is the notion that there is a myth-free territory somewhere where we can, um, you know, we can happily assume that all reasonable people, when once stripped of their eccentricities of commitment and conviction, will all agree about. And it's usually this particular myth. Yes. But coming back to this um, question of the sacred and the mondaine, it's a difficult word, mondaine, to, to render. Um, and I don't know that we've got an exact equivalent. I entirely take your point about how talking too loosely of the sacred can precisely set up one of those dualisms that have to be overcome. The sacred is what is not profane. Um, but I, I think what I'm after is some sense of how we would name that dimension in our entire experience of the material universe, which challenges us to let go of the ownership model. When I was a schoolboy um, in Wales, a novel was published in Welsh with the resonant title, Mar Orshan Gesegredeg, which means literally, everything is sacred, or more literally, the wholeness of things is sacred. It was about you know, issues of faith and doubt in, in a Welsh village, but Mar Orshan Gesegredeg, everything is, is sacred, <coughs> in the sense that 
everything we encounter will trip us over into that non-ownership frame. So um, I take the caution about the word, and I think it's important. And I suppose then that Mondin, I would have to render in terms of the search for a language which will hold on to the interconnectedness of the agencies among which we stand, which will challenge every particular way in which we seek to isolate or um, quarantine ourselves as human agents from the world in which we stand. And surely an awful lot of the, the crisis that we both recognize, that I guess we all recognize, comes from that pervasive tendency in the human mind to think, well, there is something that is quarantined, something that is protected. We are not really responsible for our actions within the material world. And mysteriously, the material world will go on feeding us what we need to keep our, our myths alive. And as you say, climate science has suddenly woken us up to the fact that um, this is a myth in the, the bad sense, in the, you know, the malign sense. This is not true. <laughs> this is a fable and illusion. I to come back. But having you propose uh, here again, and in one of your lectures in the Gifford, uh, 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 another word to talk, I mean, another way to talk about uh, the secret, which is this uh, respect for alterity. Mm -hmm. And respect for alterity can bring little bits from science, because yeah. if there is one skill and trade where the respect for alterity is essential, is the producing of, of a fact, yes. which, which are not supposed to be made up, and which are nevertheless made. Mm -hmm. So it's a very powerful mm -hmm. first uh, line of alterity. And the other one, of course, is this uh, essential point that we all agree on, uh, which is a redefinition of what it is to own, yes. and that you mentioned, which is, of course, the natural religion of, of economics as, as sort of uh, simultaneously entrenched uh, an alternative definition. But there are lots of leeways inside economics itself, as a theory. Now I'm going to giving a positive version of economics. Uh, Thank goodness. <laughs> no, because it's, I mean, we all know the work of all the anthropologists of economics, many of them are actually here at the LSE which is, on the contrary, to show that in order to obtain this definition of ownership, that is also this closure, you need an enormous amount of activity, institution, and um, uh, what dispositive, as we would say mm. in, in French, or what as Foucault would say. Mm. So that's where that's the second line of alterity where, where, where we could uh, feed on. And of course, there is the third one, which is actually was actually in the brief of uh, Professor Walter, which is that uh, the apocalyptic dimension, which the religious, at least in some tradition, bring in, mm. uh, which is a very important element, which is always uh, simultaneously negative. People accuse the people interested in climate, uh, at least in climate, as a catastrophe, to be catastrophist, uh, apocalyptic. Mm. Uh, but of course, apocalypse is an essential dimension, at least of the Christian religion. Mm. And I, I'd be interested, actually, to know how you you you, you make the you take the positive aspect of the apocalyptic uh, and, and get the poison again out, uh, because there is, of course, a poisonous element in apocalyptic mm -hmm. reasoning, which gets into the gnosticism, yes. but where, where, which is essential to the... We are, we live in... That's why I, I like to have started with the Luke 12, 56, because it, I mean, that's an essential element to read the sign of the time requires the apocalyptic dimension, yes. You would agree with me. I'm, I'm very interested that you pick up the, the apocalyptic because I think in, in the Christian tradition, but I think in certainly in other Abrahamic traditions, and I'd be interested to know more widely how people feel, the apocalyptic has yes. at least two elements. One is in the word itself. Apocalypsis is an uncovering. It's a, it's a revelation, it's a moment of clarity. And to talk about an apocalyptic situation ought to mean, first and foremost, a situation where you see what you otherwise would not see. You see that this is a crisis, as in the, the gospel text you quoted. You can, you can read the weather, but you can't read the moral weather. You can't read the... Well, now we have both. 
with the climate. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yes. The weather why, is moral weather. That's why all, all weather is moral weather. <laughs> yes. That's one dimension. The other, of course, is the, the sense that apocalypse is that moment when the world is reshaped, reconfigured, not swept away. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, says St. John in the Christian apocalypse. And he does say the first has passed away. And yet, the new world is the world of civic life. A city comes down from heaven, a community comes down from heaven. And human relations are restored and re-established and refunded in this new world. And that's apocalypse. We, we can use the word apocalypse as if it simply meant um, you know, the, the great foot coming down from heaven and the sort of squelching noise. And that's this, this is the Monty Python, Monty Python version, Python. right? Yes, okay. yes. A very important theological image of <laughs> what some people believe about <laughs> God and creation. Um, but that's not it. I think it's a far subtler and far more resourceful thing in, within the tradition. But I, I would certainly want to put a very strong emphasis at this moment, at this point in our history, on apocalypse as uncovering, as revelation, as insight, a moment of discernment, as in that gospel reading. And the tragedy is that it remains possible to deny the urgency, to deny the, the seriousness of this. Well, uh, it would be interesting to have a discussion with the other tradition which I, we presented on the dimension of the apocalypse, but the, denying, the denial of urgency is also linked to an, in a way to an apocalyptic uh, history, which is the Christian, which is very specific to Christianity, which is that, uh, and it's true of the Anglican Church as well as the Catholic Church, um, which is that, in a way, this is what Eric Vergelin calls uh, Gnosticism, mm. which is we have already, as modern, lived in apocalyptic. The realization has come. Mm. And to people who had the realization come, suddenly to be told, wait, it's coming again, and this time completely reversed. You have, modernism was not the, the, the promise, uh, the realization of a promise is a complete impossibility. Because if it were just, if we were not in this situation, given the amount of things that scientists are producing every day about the situation, it would be like saying there is a fire. We would immediately leave this room if you say there is a fire. We would not bicker and we will not hesitate even if we are not true we just leave the room so if we don't it means that there is something else we are allowed to stay in modernism because it's our fair and definitive uh, heritage so to speak yes. and we cannot hear that people come and say wait you're completely wrong i mean <laughs> this is the earth is now back and the the whole world the all apocalyptic world has to be start again and it, I think that's, that's a very interesting, yeah. that's why the moment, the decision about the, 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 the first meaning of apocalypse that you mentioned is, I think, the essential one. It, it, it's the revelation that it was not there before mm. when the Gnosticism took mm. over. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where the, the, mm. that would extend a lot of, the, not only skepticism, but a complete denial and indifference or quietism to the, situa mm. to the, to the situation. Now that, that's very helpful, actually, because I think that, that's a reminder that the way in which we've sometimes, as religious believers, talked about apocalypse, apocalyptic transformation has been to say, well, the great transition, as you say, has come. We are now already living beyond the end of the world. Right. It's done. It's done. And <laughs> you know, I, I think there's, there's a great deal of truth in that for the simple reason that to live in the church, in the kingdom of God, as a Christian would say, is yes, to live beyond the end of the world. The catch is, of course, that living beyond the end of the world, living in the eschatological community, the community of the end of time, so far from absolving you of attention to and involvement in the world around, in fact, intensifies that. It should, yeah. So the, the sacramental vision, I'm speaking again very much from a Christian point of view, the sacramental vision, among other things, would say when... Christians celebrate the sacraments, they are saying this is where creation is headed. This is the optimal form of relation between 
humans and matter and all the rest of it. But precisely because of that, it takes you out into another kind of attention to the world around, which allows apocalypse to happen all the time. You see into the heart of the problem, the crisis, again and again. The practice of faith is a practice which gives you skills of seeing the nature of the crisis you're in, rather than just shutting it out. Now, I speak there from the Christian point of view, and I'd, again, I'd be very interested and, to hear And we should open it up. Let me, other. before we do, stay on this issue that you've joined for a moment, because part of what you've joined has to do with time consciousness. It has to do not only with that. There are various dimensions of the eternal truth, but then you note that as a, that has a claim of eternity and timelessness. The notion of the secular is in part about embeddedness in time, in this world with senses of time, not just your religion in some sense. You've mentioned the image of the two cities, in effect, the Augustinian image, and tried to make clear that, that the Christian position involves, in a sense, living in both but not confounding them and being able to see beyond the limits of one all of this. I, and I want to ask you each to comment on this because it seems to me to be challenging to a lot of the ways in which we try to think about some key issues here. It, what happens if we don't have the sort of sense of the future, that is the secular future, the planetary future that we have? And, what hap and is this entirely um, a matter of hope because of the unveiling of something better building a new Jerusalem, is this, this is urgent partly because it doesn't seem hopeful entirely and portends tragedy. And what happens to an idea like stewardship, the notion of the stewardship of creation, this creation, not a potential um, new in that? I think we agree that stewardship is a at most a hubristic move. And here, Lovelock and Lord William, and I think we said the same thing. But uh, stewardship is, is, is a strange idea. I mean, it, it could be modified, of course, but uh, I think I prefer the, the, the Maltman argument that we live in the, in the ecology, the oikos, the logos, the house of the father. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's stronger. And where, where we are doing things is, is uncertain. But I, I want to come back to what you say, because secular, I think, is not the word. Secular is the enemy here. Secular is the gnostic sin. Secular, nothing is secular in that. Mundane is not, is not secular, because secular is the realization of a promise, the wrong interpretation of a realization of a promise. Exactly what you just said, no, William, that is, you, 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 you see simultaneously the realization of a promise, and you think it's done. Mm. But nothing is done. You have to start again and renew completely the situation. So there is something very dangerous with the notion of secular and secularization, which is, of course, Blumenberg's argument. But even without going into the complicated Rubenberg uh, argument, secular is not the same as mundane. Se uh, no. And that's, of course, the same, the, the, the problem with materialism, mm. with material. Right. Uh, and I was very touched that you mentioned mm. at the beginning of your initial statement that, uh, that the, the whole, when you make, be, bring agency, scientist, poet, <laughs> uh, and everybody say, yes, we are, we are among agency which are never passive. They can be deanimated, but they cannot mm. be passive. Mm. And I think that's, where, that's why the, the notion of secular, no more than the notion of sacred, would, would, would work so well, because mm. but maybe mundane is a... Well, maybe, is but let me note, secular isn't and shouldn't be reduced to the idea of secularization. And the idea of a linear secularization is a later, lesser, and different idea right. from that but which is built out of the seculum and the notion of repeated centuries and, um, and one idea of renewal. So the, the root of this does have embedded in it um, not just linear time consciousness, lin the temporality of the seculum isn't necessarily to be found in the modernist notion of linear or secularization. Not necessarily, but it seems to me that what happened in, around this question we are here to discuss, mm. which is the ecological mutation, means that the future has changed quite a lot. Yes, yes. Because, of a, yes. Indeed. Yes. because of the eruption of Gaia. Well, let, let me come back to this question of the future. Occasionally, people will say, if we cannot be confident of a future that we can salvage, what's the point? And this is where I think we have to have some regulative idea of what, uh, what a sustainable, what a 
an appropriate, a truthful mm -hmm. interaction with our environment looks like, all this, never mind whether it's going to work or not, mm -hmm. but we begin by saying, well, what, what, what is the thing to do in response to where we are? And without that, I think we, we won't have any, any kind of motivation for what lies ahead. If we're simply, put it this way, if we're simply being reactive, if somebody comes and says, unless we change our ways, the world's going to end in 10 years' time, a panic rush to change our ways. We survive 10 years. After 10 years, we think, oh, well, we got through 10 years, so now let's <laughs> get back to where we were. And in case that rings any bells, that, of course, is exactly what happened with the economic crisis of 2008. <laughs> in case you haven't noticed, um, everybody said the old models won't work. We've got to think of something else. Great clouds of dust were generated for three or four years, and mysteriously, we seem to be Pretty in many much. respects, pretty much where pretty we much. were in 2007. <laughs> <Yep>. um, <clears throat> so you have to have something else, something more robust about what the, I'll use the word, the healthy relationship is. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think, and this is one of my favorite quotes, so I, what I think Martin Luther meant when he said, if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would plant a tree. Meaning, I take it, tree planting is just one of those things that is right to do in that and of wise itself. human beings do. Yes, indeed. Well, would it be wise for us human beings to ask for some questions from the audience? That's fine. It would be very good, I think, to have some non-Christian uh, perceptions indeed. on this. Indeed, any and all. But with no particular burdens placed on the members of any one faith. <laughs> are there some themes you would like to hear mm. uh, Rowan and Bruno discuss, or some things you think are being forgotten you'd like to raise? Anyone? There is a mic at the back. There is indeed. It will come to you if you raise your hand. There is somebody about three rows from the back, two rows from the back. There we go. Hi, uh, my name is Amelia Shaman. I'm a PhD student here in the um, geography department. Uh, I was really interested, and in, uh, my research is on climate change skepticism, so it was really interesting to hear you talk about it. Uh, and one of the things that you said, Professor Latour, was that climate negationism is a sin. Uh, I, I would be really interested in, in hearing more about, you know, what you think about people who, you know, have that different type of lay knowledge and, and different experience of climate change and, and why that might necessarily be or be not a sin. <laughs> you, um, well, there are lot, lots of reasons to be skeptic. Uh, there is no scientific reason to be skeptic. There are lots of reasons to be skeptic if precisely it is uh, a request or a warning for a change of, a, of your uh, daily life. So I think there is a lo whole range. And many climate scientists I know actually say we are, in fact, in practice, climate skeptics because we do nothing or very little for the science we nevertheless see. Or we take planes, very expensive in terms of CO2 planes, to uh, go to a conference to limit the CO2. So I mean, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of, lots of practical reason of being, of being, of being uh, skeptical. And of course, there are lots of skeptics which are very well grounded by people who say we had nothing to do with the crisis. I mean, it's not us. Uh, people in India or people in Brazil or people uh, in, in uh, Africa, they, they, they dream of using a little bit of the CO2 that we have been using. Actually, this is why people say the Anthropocene should be called the Anglocene, because it's actually you guys here, I mean, the English guys, uh, <laughs> who, have, who have started that for two centuries. And uh, to this day, actually, China is still very small compared to Britain. Britain is the most, uh, in terms of CO2 production, because you started very early. Um, <laughs> So you have seen for a much longer time than, than we have, a, and there is a whole. Uh, so there are lots of reasons to be uh, to to say no, no. I'm not going to heed this call for change because because there are too many things to change, or because I have no responsibility in it. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that the, the dispute now in all is, is, is almost, I mean, apart from the United States a little bit, maybe here actually in this country, it's not about the fact that the, the science is bunk because I mean, no fact of science has ever been so well uh, entrenched now. But it is, there are lots of other reasons. So 
it, is, it requires something like a conversion, basically. And that's why what you said, which is, I think, extremely important, that it has to be apocalyptic in a way. There is no reason to avoid the term, because it is absolutely important to see that the future is defi defined differently. There is no earth. The earth, which we have to recover, is, is actually coming to us mm. as an eruption under the name of Gaia, and it m modifies the, the, the time space in which we are. So there are lots of reasons why climate, climate change, clim reaction to climate change, if I understood right your question, is a major anthropological issue, and of course, uh, a Gaia political issue also. If I can just yeah, please. add a word. I think there, there may be all kinds of, as Professor uh, Latour has said, all kinds of reasons for climate skepticism. I find it very, very difficult to understand why people in this area do not apply the straightforward levels of probability that they apply in every other area of their lives. That's, that's by the way. But I wanted to throw in just one other remark which comes from Doris Lessing, the novelist. Some of you may know her series of science fiction novels from the 1980s, um, Canopus in Argus. Um, a mixed critical reception for those novels, I think it's fair to say, but one of the most interesting things they do is to imagine Earth seen from an extraterrestrial perspective. And one remark made in a report made back from Earth to another planet is this appears to be a species deficient in the proper sense of fear. <laughs> that is, we do not know what to be afraid of. <laughs> that stuck with me for 30 plus years, and I still think it's right. Okay, Let's have a question of the gentleman in the third row here. <clears throat> Hold your hand up so they can see you and give you the mic. Thank you. Uh, Mike Hume, uh, King's College Geography Department. Um, just wanted to pick up on this uh, idea again about diversity that the previous questioner was suggesting and connecting it with, I think, Rowan, you mentioned the phrase from David Martin, we cannot live without myth as human beings. Uh, and of course, there are multiple myths. There are many myths that are very powerful, these narratives. Economics, you mentioned as one, but one could frame other powerful driving narratives as being mythical. Uh, for example, the idea of science itself as producing true and trustworthy knowledge that will guide us safely I into the future, or technology itself is mythical in that sense. Hedonism is a myth that many of us um, touch upon. So, so my point is actually there are many guiding myths, uh, and I just want to explore then how you engage with this diversity or plurality of myths in the context of what, uh, for example, Lovelock with his Gaia metaphor has framed as a universal and a global uh, entity uh, and this unveiling of a global crisis. But yet we are different. Uh, we follow and are guided by different myths. And this partly goes back to this idea of skepticism. So how, how does one find a way, collectively, of allowing these myths to work together, or indeed allowing them to work separately, and therefore to pull us in different ways? Mm. That, that's a hugely complex question, I think. Um, but let me try and um, think for a moment about it. First of all, I guess, myths have their traction, their, their force, to the extent that they are long-term livable. You know, if you have um, certain kinds of myth which manifestly drive against the grain of the environment you're in, they probably won't last that long. Though, you know, North Atlantic consumerism has had a pretty good track record so far. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, pass over that. That means, I think, that one of the things which, when myths or myth believers are in touch with each other, one of the things they are going to be talking about is what sorts of traction, what sorts of credibility they have in the world we're actually in, in the world that we recognize, we inhabit together, um, what makes things 
believable. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, Graham Ward's new book, um, Unbelievable, which has some wonderful stuff about Graham's here, so um, I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> but lots of very good stuff about what makes belief believable. Um, then moving on a bit from that, I think to recognize that all our myths are to some extent engaging with recognizably similar situations, we may find ourselves in the position of saying, well, no one story gives us the global answer. And I don't by that to mean in, uh, intend by that to mean any you know, religious relativism or moral relativism or whatever. It's just that as a matter of bare fact, no one way of talking gives us everything we need to confront a global crisis. It's not just my crisis, a Christian one, a Jewish one, a Buddhist one, a Muslim one. It's a human crisis. So I would want to see, I want to ask the question, where are the Where's the forum, where's the, um, the space in which different narratives can mm, finger each other's texts and say yes, in order to, to respond together to a crisis that belongs to all of us, how do we listen and exchange and work? So you spoke particularly Rowan. I want to hear from Bruno on this, and I'm also still struck whether we're getting more of a more humanistic account of this in the human crisis than in some of the Gaia discussion. But well, I, I have a different answer to that, which is uh, <coughs> to link uh, this question of narrative to test them, and one great way to test them is, is, is the arts, and, and that's why uh, I'm very interested uh, on, on, on theater. I'm interested in exhibition. We, we just had in Toulouse last week an amazing uh, meeting with Jan Zalazevich, who is the head of a subcommittee for quaternary stratigraphy and uh, responsible for the word Anthropocene, a word which has not been pronounced yet here, so now it's pronounced. Uh, and he was actually uh, playing with artists about what it is to make the Anthropocene uh, sensitive. I mean, how, 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 can become, how do you become sensitive to the Anthropocene, which of course is impossible because it's too vast, too global. And it's actually a <coughs> very, my experience with the artist and with the scientist is that it's a very, very rich way to test narrative. Because of course nothing is global, but no, no is, nor is the science. Science is not global. And Gaia actually, I've argued recently, is not global either. And it, it's about model. It's about be, basically s s small stage things. I mean, a model of the Earth would hold here except the computer will use a lot of energy and it will be a lot of energy to be... Uh, and there is a very interesting exhibition now in Berlin called the Anthropocene um, uh, Project, which is about making the Anthropocene science visible. And there is a great show at the Science Museum also on that. So there are lots of other ways of testing the narrative. The notion of, of narrative is actually uh, opened up a, a large collaboration between science, art, and the social science. And I think it's a very, very important thing that the university should do, because that's their job, really, to test narratives with other tools. Could, could I just say that yeah. I, I would very much agree that the role of the arts in this becomes crucial in giving people images to think with, um, exchanges, conversations, narratives to think with, and that, that has to be a part of... That's an old tradition of a churches as well. Yes, yes. Indeed. Let's return to another question from the audience. Please, second row. Uh, take the microphone so the recorder catches it. I was. I found the um, Rowan's initial point about ownership uh, very compelling, uh, it, it, but it's made the, when the, in the context of this secular uh, of the word secular profane or se se uh, se secular sacred distinction, and uh, I'm interested that Professor Latour. Um, doesn't like that that was secular, and I, I wonder therefore how how he would articulate that whether he agrees with that point and how he would articulate it. Because I'm not, it wasn't entirely clear about why what his reservations were about the secular language. Secular, um, I mean, there are a whole literature on that, but uh, in a word, secular would I mean not in the sense that uh, Greg mentioned, but in the 
it, it, it's actually the his, it, it defines a certain definition of what is God, except it's a crossed out God, but it's still there, which is a very odd God to have a crossed out God, not a cross crucified God, a crossed mm -hmm. out God, it's not, not the same. It defines a certain, uh, it has a certain cosmology about matter, which it has a certain definition of science, which is very odd because it's a science of a viewed from nowhere that defines series of causes and consequences. Uh, it has a very, it, uh, it based on the fact value distinction, which is a very strange form of politics and so on and so forth. So with the word secular, you, you buy an enormous baggage of history, which is of course the history since the scientific revolution. Uh, you, you buy a lot of, of religious and anti-religious uh, argument. It's a whole package which is difficult to then reopen and then see what you want to keep. And of course, when the ecology movement came, they, they, they took this, the, the, this very complicated package and they tried to play simultaneously with naturalism, uh, when they say we have to save nature, as if nature was out there, and also the sacred. I say we have to have a sacred view of nature in order to respect it. A, a lot of deep ecology do that as well. So th this is inheriting the whole dispute, which is coming, starting from the, the invention of Gnosticism, basically. And it, it's dangerous to, I mean, it's, it, you could use it, but it, you buy too much with it. And I'd like to inspect what is inside the notion of secular, so to speak. Craig, you, you use the word humanist a little while mm. ago. Can you say a bit more about your... Well, one of the what is in your mind? Yes. So I'll say uh, well, two things. One, in, even in relation to that, the, there are lots of histories to lots of words. Something you've been very interested in, and Bruno's evoked as well with the secular as well. What was going on with priests with a secular vocation um, in the medieval and early modern period, when the idea of a secular vocation, a different kind of ministry in the world, is there? So, the term has meant a lot of things in a lot of time. I don't know how much we want to come back into that with the secular, and the same with human, where we have everyday ideas about humanists, that is. Um, we have the humanities as academic fields. We have humanists and the claim um, of a certain kind of um, often atheist or at least non-religious voice to be a humanist voice, which I think is a, a claim that is ideological and tendentious uh, to contain that. I brought it up because of a sense of of tension, I won't describe it to the two of you, but I, I hear some of it here. Between attempts to think the discourse of climate and some related um, questions about nature, if you will, no terms are neutral, including climate and nature in this, to think them as, um, the, as rendering obsolete or hubristic too much reference to human agents in um, all of this. And, wanting to say from the perspective of Gaia um, and some accounts that, that we have too much idea of our own importance when we talk about the human in this. Right. At the same time, in a Christian discussion and in your discussion, there is something um, often very important about the human and commenting in the interfaith context on things being not Buddhist or Muslim or Jewish or Christian but human problems. And so I wonder, Prok, is when in this discussion do we speak of things as human problems? It is a human problem that we face climate change. When is it not the right language to be speaking of it as a human problem? Should we be speaking of it as a Gaia problem or localizing Gaia as Bruno is doing? And it's even bigger than Gaia in some sense. A divine problem? Earthbound. <laughs> Earthbound. We are not human. Hmm. We are not, earthbound. Not human. <laughs> or Terrians, <laughs> or Earthlings. I mean, there are lots of other words. It's, it's, quite like it's a terrestrial yes. problem. Okay. It's, it's a pity that the word Earthlings... You like Earthlings? <laughs> I quite like it myself, but it does sound like you know, B-movie science fiction, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah well, what about Earthbound? Yeah, so Earthbound. Nano, nano. Yeah. <laughs> but just back to um, trying to dissolve some of the, the unhelpful polarities here. Um, we're aware that in a lot of the past, we, and I mean religious believers among others, have set up this problem by regarding human beings as in some sense privileged with ownership, privileged with power, privileged with control, or stewardship indeed. Mm -hmm. And the reaction to that is to say, well, no, no, there's nothing, nothing at all particular about human beings or human dignity or human nature. We must just forget the human. We must not be anthropocentric. 
But I think that's, that's just to give a, a mirror image of the problem you're starting mm -hmm. with. Human beings are precisely earthbound. They are, in all their distinctiveness, part of the system. And to say we must forget the human perspective as if we could isn't going to take us much further than saying the human perspective is, is what determines everything. So I'd want, to, I'd want to try and retrieve a sense of the human as indeed utterly embedded in the agencies of the universe, exercising a very specific linguistic and social creativity, which we don't see in those terms elsewhere, rather than just saying there is a, a, a hostility between the human and the earth. But the problem that there are hostility between humans and other humans, Ah, well, yes. I was in uh, New York in, oh, the, <laughs> in, the, in the march uh, a few weeks ago, and it was very interesting. The march was organized by argument, and one of the arguments, there was an argument in interfaith, by the way, which is the debate is over for scientists and interfaith, which is together, which was quite amusing. And then there was another one which was called, uh, we know who is responsible. So depending on where, which street you were choosing, you were choosing which argument you wanted to, <laughs> to participate in. And it was very interesting because, of course, uh, who, we know who is responsible means what are the fight between humans about it. So ecology is not something which pacifies. Mm. Ecological question is something which actually increases the foes, I mean, <laughs> friends and foes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where if we want to designate the enemy, um, because that's what it will have to be, we know who is responsible. Well, the English first, because the Anglo scene, and then a few other companies as well. I mean, you know, it's not the whole humanity. It's very specific, very specific people. We know the address, so to speak. And, and here, that's where the, the, the interest of a, of a question of humanism is, is it appears, because do we want to defend the human, or do we want to attack some human mm. associated with some definition of a landscape, some definition of what it is to be to have a cosmology and so on. And that, when we begin to do those sort of uh, territory, uh, we have a very, very different view of, the, of politics, what's mm. upon, what mm -hmm. I call Gaia politics mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. geopolitics. Mm. And things become more tense then, because it's not about being nice with the Earth. OK, we've got several hands up. I see two in the back. I see one in the front, in whatever order you can get to them. Hi. Um, so, having just recognised that um, uh, the in, that we're in a global problem, that is, you know, human problem, what are the roles of each of the individual religions and non-religions in moving forward now? Um, and I think, if I understood correctly, what Lord Williams was referring to earlier, um, that we need to move away from economic growth and the obsession with economic growth. Okay, let, why don't we take a couple? Yes, and then, yeah, so this is and the, the issue of what are the specific roles for religions. The other hand that was up there. Do you, do you want me to go now? Yes. Um, well, I wonder if I could, uh, we, whether we could even be more optimistic. I know that Professor Latour is keen that uh, any human collectivity should be able to um, name the entity by which it is invoked or convoked. And for Gaia, that's a little bit of an opportunity, really, because Gaia isn't yet composed. And so there may be new configurations by which the people of Gaia might settle for the, for the better. Um, OK, we've settled back into our old habits of consuming, even since 2007. But what if we can uh, become the people of Gaia what will we look like in a 100 years? Uh, what will happen if the Etch-a-Sketch is shaken up and there's a new blank uh, slate by which humans can uh, collect? Is there anything more, is there an optimistic vision <laughs> for the future? Okay, let's take these two. We have the, the specific role of religion and the rethinking in, in this case. You want to start, either, either of you volunteering here? Well, uh, okay. I'll, they've I'll each nodded. Let the record show they've each nodded at the other encouragingly. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's have a go. Um, in terms of 
practical steps. I do think it's, it's extremely important at the most basic pragmatic level that local religious communities are able to articulate for their adherents some basic steps that can be taken, not in the hope of saving the situation overnight, but simply in the hope of restoring what I call the healthy, the sustainable relationship, something which is apt. I like the word apt, something that fits that is truthful to the environment we're in, so that we, we think of religious, and indeed non-religious, virtue as having something to do with how we relate to our environment. That, I think all religious communities can just do that more intensely than they do. And if that means um, advice as basic as turn the tap off when you're brushing your teeth, so be it. You know, As William Blake said, doing good in small particulars is where it all begins. Um, so I, I do think that's something open to all of us. And that relates a little bit to the hope thing, because there are ways of talking about this which disempower. There are ways which awaken. We need to find the ways that awaken something. Just on growth, briefly, um, it's a very, very slow burn, but I do see an increasing number of serious writers without a huge axe to grind. The Skidelskys, of course, in their excellent book, How Much is Enough? Um, the Wilkinson and Pickett spirit level book, and all of these books which are you know, doing the rounds in the last couple of years. David Marquin's book, Mammon's Kingdom, beginning to put the question, can we intelligibly talk about an indefinite spiral of growth? in a finite environment. Well, no, we can't, so what are we going to do about it? Um, so that, I think, is part of the answer. And it's not saying, oh, well, we, we must set ourselves against economic growth full stop. We need to dismantle the, the words economic growth. We need to lay out the components of that and say, well, this is what we mean when we want something positive or liberating. This is what we mean when Growth just means growth for its own sake. Just spread it out, reorganize, refocus. And a last word on, on hope. Um, I've always wanted to keep clear the distinction between hope and optimism. Optimism says, well, it's all going to be all right, really. Hope says, I've no idea whether it's going to be all right, really, but I know, I know what I need to do. <laughs> and to get that, that energy moving. You know the old chestnut about um, the pessimist and the optimist. The uh, optimist says this is the best of all possible worlds and the pessimist says I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> Think about it. And we have been talking about multiple possible worlds here and a coming of a new world. But, but there is a difficulty with, with the fin finite, finite and inf infinite because we have known that since Malthus. Mm. And in fact, and since the Club of Rome to take one in each century. Mm. So there is, a di there is an added difficulty there which is, expect which is related to the question about the people of Gaia, uh, which is related to the mundane aspect, which is the mundane of politics. Expecting for politics something which is mundane is a big, big, big shift. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, in the Gnostic argument, politics is supposed to deliver something which is what the optimists call hope. And that's not the job of politics. Politics is just getting by. <laughs> and so there, there's, there's something which is, in the, in the whole ecology, there's a great danger around the ecological uh, uh, crisis, which is to reinvest all the, the bad hopes, so to speak, which had been invested into, uh, let's say, socialism, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in Gaia as a sovereign. Mm -hmm. So I begin to hear things which are very worrying, like, uh, Gaia wants us to stop eating meat, for example. And then suddenly you realize that there is a new uh, sort of uh, actor of history, <laughs> which is given order through its militant all the way down, and a re-invention re, uh, of the notion of a globe, precisely. And that's why it's so important to understand that Gaia is not a global, including in Lovelock, or well, scientifically it's not a globe. It's an interconnection, but it's not a global. It's not holistic, in a way. So there's a great danger of a holistic view. And that's a problem with the, with the people. Uh, that's why I, I introduced the notion of tell who, which people you have, which God, 
which people and which cosmos. And then we begin to discuss, because it's not, as long as we don't have that people articulating clearly which God is summoning them, which people are they assembling, and which cosmos they live in, it's very difficult even to tackle the question. Because then the global arrives much too quickly. And it arrives in economy, it arrives in science, it arrives in politics, and every time the globe arrives too quickly, you're back to the, uh, to, to Gnosticism, basically. David, the second row here. Uh, what do each of the three of you think is the responsibility of an institution like LSE or Cambridge, or even Magdalen College, Cambridge, uh, in, in response to this? So much for being the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not from the LSE, nor from Cambridge, so... <laughs> Why did you stop the start? <laughs> Fine, I'll start with an answer, and they can chime in and improve mm. it. The first obligation of this kind of institution, a university, is to have this kind of discussion, it seems to me, and other discussions that bear on this among diverse people um, where diversity means intellectual starting points, positions in this particular debate, positions in the world, and so forth. That um, if universities aren't convening, convoking such discussions, um, they're not going to happen and happen as well. And one of the losses that we have is that universities don't do that as much as we might hope because they're busy with a variety of other disciplinary knowledge projects and, and other agendas besides this. So that, I would say, is, is the first. A second is to um, try to continually improve the knowledge basis for such discussions. Um, and that means both recognizing where knowledge is wrongly claimed to be more perfect than it is, as well as um, uh, trying to bring it closer to perfection continuously so that the, the critical dimension and the positive dimension of improving the knowledge, raising the quality of the debate by improving the knowledge on, on every side seems to me very important in this. Um, notice that neither of those were precisely about being um, the advocates for a position, um, but about um, um, enabling the, the advancement of the discussion. I think those are the two basic things. I think universities need to enable people to um, pursue sometimes different and even potentially contradictory lines and to be advocates for their lines in this and have the academic freedom and the general freedom to do that, to make the claims. But they don't necessarily have to engineer the agreement and become protagonists um, in the, the debates. So there's a very um, off-the-cuff starting point for it. I'd, I'd echo very strongly what's been said about the need for an institution to, to stage debate in the most public and interdisciplinary style possible. But I would add that the sheer practical question, universities and colleges have practices ranging from what they eat, how they heat their buildings, where they place their investments. And that there should be Absolutely. in every institution people whose job it is to ask awkward questions about that, I think is, is essential. We, we have to show that this is not just, um, not just aspirational. And I find in, in college, one of the issues that keeps coming back is about investment policy along with um, mm -hmm. issues about where we, where we look for skill and resource in architects that we're using, um, whether we are factoring into every physical development involved considerations about sustainability, just to keep it, keep it alive at that daily decision-making level. And I, I do think that's, that's essential for a, an institution. I completely agree. Anything to add? Well, I have just one, one uh, practical thing, which is that we, we, we like to do in my own school, which is uh, only partially here, um, simulation with the student. We are doing a big one uh, next year, I hope, with some of the people of the LSE to try to mimic, but in a better way, the climate conference, which will be in Paris in December, 
2015. So we, we have 300 students coming, trying to, to, do, to do the simulation differently. And if anyone here is interested, we would, I would be glad to develop that. So to, that's a practical thing, practical way. And of course, that's, that's possible only if you have natural science and social science together, together with artists and other people mm -hmm. who are ma theater people, managing something like the climate conference, a small, of course, it's a simulation, but trying to m modify what are the basis for the discussion and the negotiation. And I think that's one of the many things that university and museum, m museum are very important. Uh, can invent because now museum and university are merging more and more. Mm. I've done myself several exhibits, and it, it's it's a very important uh, tool for the university. I think. Mm -hmm. Please. Hi. Um. So I work for the Anglican Alliance, which you set up, um, but um, we've just joined uh, an interfaith campaign for a strong climate treaty at the UNFCCC next year in Paris. Um, so we're hoping to kind of gather lots of interfaith voices for that. But I wonder what you think, if and if you think the UNFCCC is significant and, and why, and why it might be important for the interfaith community to get behind a strong climate treaty, or if you think that that's a not, not a significant thing to do. What do what you think, basically? Um, it seems to me that it is a very significant thing for faith communities to get behind. Um, expectations for the treaty are high and probably unrealistic, but we have to keep the conversation going there. I think without some really robust, really um, seriously resourced input from faith communities, that discussion is going to be much more sterile. So to keep alive, let's use the word, the apocalyptic, in a sense, that's, that's where the faith communities come in, in the sense of speaking truth, uncovering, I would hope. So good luck. Well, it was actually amusing because in New York, at the same, the Sunday was the big march, and then there was the Ban Ki-moon uh, meeting, and several of uh, my friends were in the second meeting, where absolutely nothing happened. It was the same, absolutely humdrum, completely boring, nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, it was amazing. They were completely uh, disillusioned. While there were 300,000 people in the street, the connection that has to be made. Mm. And it, what was even more amusing for me is that I was playing the play, Gaia Global Circus, which I had written about it. So there was actually simultaneously three of them one of which is mass, the other one very small, but on, on, on art, and one official, completely boring. So that, that, that's, I think, where, where the things can move, because you have to mix both free and something else appear. If I but can, at, yeah. As Lord Williams said in one of his piece, there is no example of any movement by a politician with, which is not pushed by a constituency. That's right. So if there is no constituency, nothing will happen. It's true. I was going to add one of the things that universities, as a particular kind of institution, offer is a space in which people, students in particular, are able to be participants in various ways to form. They are concentrated together in a, and that, that provides resources. We, are, we consistently do something that, that aids and abets the compartmentalizing of this. So we compartmentalize knowledge. And we say, oh, well, we have at the LSE an extraordinary institute doing research on climate change. This is very good. And it actually breaks out of saying it's only a problem for atmospheric scientists and tries to bring in economics. But international relations or anthropology or philosophy or 20 other fields. And so we consistently do this. And I think that in this, we will not contend well with the issues raised by things like climate change, by just take climate change and thus with the challenges of the treaty in the UN, if it isn't also a focus for knowledge in a variety of different areas, it's a problem of international relations the way the nation state system works. It's not just a problem of climate as something else. Mm -hmm. It's a problem of global political economy. It's a problem of, of a range of these. Mm -hmm. and, and if we aren't able to come together, as we come together across faith communities, across these other lesser faith communities of academic disciplines, 
we really aren't going to be facilitating grappling with the biggest challenges before us. Well, one of the things which um, Professor Latour's last remarks made me think was that, of course, discussing climate change will get us into discussing what democracy means sooner mm -hmm. or later in a very acute and possibly uncomfortable way. That's just a, another footnote. Life and other things. We have time for just a couple of more questions. I see a hand. I can't see the face attached to the hand. Oh, there it is. The okay, just behind the camera. Hi. Um, I'm a first year student, so forgive me if the question doesn't come off completely clear. Um, I was very interested by what uh, Lord Williams was speaking about in terms of apocalypse. And my question is, how can we definitively say when it is? I mean, if you look through history, there's been people that have claimed it was apocalypse. For example, in the plague that we had um, a few centuries ago, many people saw that as being a clean slate, and that was ridding, say, the filth, for example. So how can you decide that maybe this is apocalypse or the future? <laughs> you should not. If you know what I mean. Okay, this is not what you know. No. Okay, you're getting an answer. Yep. No, no, I mean, the, the, techni <laughs> the technical answer will come from the specialist. But I, <laughs> I know my gospel well enough. You should not ask when the time and... Well, there we are. You have your specialist answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, what has this do. generation to ask for a sign? No sign will ever given to him. I'm something of a fantasy. Sign journal, <laughs> yes. Um, that, it, that is the answer. But the great mistake is to confuse apocalypse as unveiling the seriousness of a crisis with apocalypse as giving you the date of the end of the world so that you can be comfortable about it. Yeah. Or something, at least. Um, right. you know, if the world is going to end next Friday week, well, you know, at least you, you've got something to work on. <laughs> Whereas if you're simply faced with the question, is the way you are living possible? That's a, a deeper one, a tough one. And actually, that's the question of the gospel those terms, not can we, can we safely um, bank the date of the end of the world so that we know what's going to happen and that we're safe going through it. It's much more, so what do you do now if, if, your, if your life is unsustainable? It's interesting because of course the, the very notion of agnosticism according to Virgil is precisely the shift from one meaning to the next yeah. and the idea that the future is actually determined and that's of course where the, where the it, it, it called a sin in our tradition. Mm. Um, just to pick up on another sort of biblical image other than apocalypse, I wonder um, what the fire panel thinks about um, biblical language of covenant in relation to thinking about responsibility uh, mm. and uncovering and relationship. Covenant, yes. Thinking particularly of the Noachic. Um, yes. Yeah. And also in it's Hosea, isn't it? The, the restored covenant. Covenant is language which allows us to talk about dependable relation. And when God promises to make a covenant with the wine and the oil in Hosea, I take it that what we're to hear is God saying, when justice is restored, then you will understand what a dependable environment means, that the covenant made with God's people becomes connected with the, the covenant, the, the sort of fidelity of the environment we're in, the dependability of it. And I think God's commitment to what God has made in our tradition is an immensely important element in this, that the world for God, if one can be very bold here, the world for God is not something made at arm's length and dropped into a void. The world is the outworking of those energies, those operations which, which flow from that unconditioned act which is, which is the divine. I, I could let go on, but that's, that's a start. <laughs> Did you want to add anything to that? Well, I've, of course, that's the reason why I'm so interested in Gaia, because there's no covenant with Gaia. It's more like the story of Pi. I mean, you are in a, in a boat with a tiger, and the tiger will not be domesticated, and you have to survive, and the, the tiger ignores you. So there is a very interesting figure 
in Gaia, which is not nature, because nature was indifferent to us, uh, but it was uh, not mobilized or modified by us either. So the indifference of nature was a great asset, so to speak. And of course, a large part of theology was built in complete indifference to nature because of that, because it was indifferent, precisely. It was supposed to the stuff, mm. uh, dry, middle-sized goods, basically. And uh, the, the new, uh, that's why we all have difficulty even answering the question of covenant now, because, of course, what it is to have, to be in a, in a boat, to make the metaphor uh, of a story of Pi, with, with a being which is uh, no longer indifferent, but which is trying, and, and no longer hostile, just, just reacting to what you react to. And that's a new situation where we, are, we, we have absolutely no uh, preparation, because it's not nature, and it's not God, and it's not any of the pagan God either. It's a completely new situation. We, this is why the word, we have to find a word for mundane, where, where precisely it is a power. That's what I call the state of nature. I mean, the state of nature, to be invented, the state of nature not in the Hobbesian sense, but in a very, very different sense. That is, uh, for us, completely puzzling in terms of, of political philosophy. And there is a whole political philosophy to invent about what, what it is. I mean, is, is it a civic type of God? Is Gaia a type of civic God? In a way, yes, but it doesn't resemble any of the civic God. It's not a cosmological God, even though it has some cosmological dimension, but it's local. Gaia is just the Earth. I mean, it's not the Moon, it's not the, the universe. It's just a very local being. It's very superficial. Gaia is just a little pellicule, what geophysicists call the critical zone. It's a very small pellicule, it's a few kilometers thick. So we have absolutely no experience of what this thing, and yet it's not indifferent because it reacts very, very fast. I mean, every single day in the scientific literature, they realize how fast it reacts. Tipping point. I mean, all the, every day you get every every hypothesis of the IPCC has been wrong. Wrong because it's, they were optimistic. Underestimating, yeah. Underestimating, every single one of them. So we, we have a new situation. This is why we have a new Earth. What, I, what I'm always saying is that it's, it's like the discovery of, of the uh, new continent in the time of a great discovery, except it's not a new continent. It's the same. But now it's a tiger. <laughs> if I can add one comment, exceeding the moderator's role in this, any thinking about covenant today in the West is marked by the 17th century and the, the way in which a sort of contractarian rethinking of the idea of the biblical idea of covenant in terms of the language of contract mm -hmm. affecting both social contract ideas in political philosophy but um, borrowing from the growing ubiquity of commercial contracts and rethinking what it would mean for there to be a contract between God and people and other kinds of contracts. So I think it's very hard in the West to escape the heritage of 17th century England when using this particular vocabulary. Mm. Yeah. But Michel Serre wrote a book a few years ago called Natural Contract. And it, it's very interesting to read because when you read it now, it looks very old because you were, this, natural contract was not the story of pi. Mm. It, was, it was precisely still very quiet, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. You could establish a contract. Now yeah. it, you can't. Mm. Now the question is, do you survive? I mean, that's a very different story. And making covenant in that direction is very, very, very different. It's a, it's a big change of time. All right. Mention of time, I think I should call time. But let me thank, um, first of all, uh, Rowan Williams and Bruno Latour for great comments. Let me thank all of you. Let me thank those who made this possible and conclude especially by thanking the donors who made possible the Faith Center and the memories that are uh, enshrined in this creation and everyone who worked on it. Thank you for being here.